So when we came in, they didn't think of us as these researchers who were going to do X, Y, or Z. They thought of us as people who were going to help them organize their materials. We had the Women's Center. Um, we got additional funding from one agency to work with them to do the cataloging themselves. So we had five women, two of whom were kind of homeless, the other three were kind of in weird living situations. And we met once a week with them. So they really got great computer skills. And it was really, really interesting to watch them go from like, what do you want to know? To saying, what will other people want to look up in our newsletter? So that transition, which I didn't really anticipate as something to need to do work around, was really, really interesting to watch. And so finally they started to think, oh, you know, they want to know this and they want to know that. So the outcome of that piece of the project was to use their archive of materials to create a book about the women's center. And again, we let them decide how that would work. And so we kind of facilitated discussions with them about whether they wanted to have a historical structure or a topical structure. And so they went back and forth about the relative value of each of those structures, and they kind of found something in between the two. Um, and so we printed that. That was great. One of my proudest days was when the governor general came to visit the women's center. And they ran in the back and they said, here's a book that we produced. And in the back, there's a tiny, tiny little Simon Fraser helped us do this. Our logo's not in it. I was in trouble because our stuff wasn't on there. But I was like, if they don't think we need any more thanks than that, then that's fine. <laughs> we know what we did, you know. So they really, really owned that product. And so when we saw them give it to the governor general, um, we worked with the Drug Users Union. Um, they, they, they then with sort of the people organizing the neighborhood really project. So we were very, very, very closely, my research group was really closely associated with them. We did a lot of um, organizing the materials. So they wanted to do an HIV and homelessness Thing, and so we helped them organize their completely disorganized library and digitize it. And then they were able to search for the materials they wanted. And that was a fun project because the question of footnotes came up. And so they wanted people to believe this. And so they like, we have to have quotes. So they went through this really, really interesting process of thinking about how do we credentialize a pamphlet that we're producing. So that was, you know, another case where we sort of we were able to do some work around like what does it mean to have research and deploy research and policy So they had a fight about whether they had a million or none. <laughs> a million or none. Yeah. Um, other groups that were involved. There were a number of um, different kinds of housing and poverty advocacy groups that had arisen over different points in time that were focused on youth or Aboriginal issues or uh, some combination of anti-gentrification stuff. So I think there were 25 groups altogether. Uh, I had contact with a lot of them, but I had grad students and undergrad students actually who were doing a lot of that work, and some of them were participants in the organizations. That was always the better scenario, because then they could go and explain what the project was and get I don't even know how to phrase this. The bad way of phrasing it would be to get buy-in. Um, it was more about helping people envision having all of their stuff in one publicly accessible place that anyone in the whole world can actually access. So that was kind of like a difficult vision to sell. We worked with a lot of librarians and archivists, so we got a whole education in like library science because they were all telling us to do like contradictory things. They were like, you know, the community wants this, so how can we make that work? Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much for talking about this case of what I understand is research for research's sake. 
Um, I feel like it really speaks to the core of the value of academic studies that probably we don't think about enough. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, so just on a very naive level, so the, this housing crisis you're describing, I'm wondering if there are any consensus among the, the groups that you mentioned, to how do they feel that this, this situation can be not, maybe not solved, but you know, attenuated, if, if not by this, this huge government-funded research project? I would, in, a, in an interesting way, I would say Vancouver actually didn't have a housing crisis at the time. Um, it had a housing crisis in that there's a, like a really low vacancy rate, and there were a lot of really, really, really rich people buying housing for speculation. So there were units sitting vacant, um, but that was all dealt with, with like excess taxation. So if you don't have someone living in your apartment now, you pay like a big tax. And if you're caught doing that and not paying the tax, you pay a really, really, really big fine. So there were a bunch of mechanisms that were already existing legal mechanisms for dealing with the amount of housing that was available. So the number of homeless people, it's usually put around maybe 3,000 people, 1,500 to 3,000 people. That's a really, really small number of homeless people for a city of like two and a half million, actually. So, the idea that it was a crisis really is less about something numerical than it was about it being a moral crisis. That a city that was so wealthy that it had Expo 86 and the world came and the world stayed mm -hmm. and had the Olympics in 2010 and the world came and the world stayed. Mm -hmm. We're like a, you know, before Expo, Vancouver was a quarter of the size it is now. So we're really a place that's attracted people who came and said, oh my god, this is the most beautiful place on the planet. I'll do anything to come and live in this place. Okay. So part of the problem is that it seems morally impossible that not everybody, even a small number of people, remain with no home. So the solution really is to have more housing. There's a broad consensus that that's the basic problem. There needs to be more housing. Um, everyone's like, from the, from the middle class down, everyone's in a housing that is a level or two lower than what they could probably actually afford. Because the middle to upper housing is so incredibly expensive that middle class people can't live in middle class housing. So there's a bunch of internal structural problems like that cause everyone to be kind of pushing the next lower group down. So um, this is the basic problem. And there is a consensus about this problem. Where there isn't a consensus is how to get the housing built. So when the two housing societies participated, they weren't all that happy about it. I was actually working really, really closely with one of the societies at that time. And we would. Um, <coughs> The, after the after the Winter Olympics, the, the housing that was built for the Olympics volunteers was these modular units, and they were all given to housing societies. So after the Olympics were over, there were some pieces of land in Vancouver that got 120 of these pots. They were really, really cool, really cool, like fabulous housing units. And so when they were developed, like placing those and putting people in, they were like, can you do like a evaluation from the beginning so we can figure out like what's working and what's not working. So me and the head of the agency would drive to that place and I would harangue him, like, how the hell did you do this? You know, why are you involved in this? Do you know that the study design is completely bogus? And he's like, yeah. He said, I don't know that scientifically, but I've had the feeling from the beginning that like they're on this path and we're on this path. But it was the only way we could get funding at this point in time to do this stuff. So the, the moral consensus is there, and nobody, I don't think anybody except the researchers and the politicians were actually happy with the project. The researchers obviously got all this like, oh, you're so fabulous. They're like the cool people. They get all the green and yellow colors and all this stuff. And the politicians can say, oh, we did this amazing study and we've proven or something like that. So everybody else in the game, in the system, agrees that there just needs to be more housing. 
And if it's there, then they'll figure out how to allocate people to it so that no one's in a dangerous setting. Like the, one of the problems now is that you've got heterogeneous groups of people. So one of the new buildings that went up, they kind of were like, anyone can live here. Really, really quickly, they had problems. I did that evaluation too. And I was like, OK, you need a women's floor. And you need a floor for the people with HIV. And if you do that, you know, then the men can run crazy. And the drug users can shoot drugs. And they're not mingling with one another. And they're not going to cause problems for each other. Um, there were a couple of places where there were very, very frail elderly people. And they had to have all these extra social services because they were terrified to go into the bathroom because they were getting robbed and beaten. So, yeah. so they had to have like, porta potties and all this like fairly expensive care in their rooms because they couldn't go to the bathrooms. And so things like that were getting straightened out. So it was like, OK, we need to take those seniors out of that place and stick them all in this new building. So there's a capacity within the system, you know, people, as you were saying, in NGOs and the frontline service, people know what the problems are. And they know this set of seven people need to be not here. They need to be in something like that. But there's no capacity within the system to allow that to happen, actually, in any kind of smooth way. Uh, one of the things I talked about yesterday was one of the bad effects of having the research project was it convinced everybody that research needed to be done. And that whatever people were doing as social workers and advocates was somehow biased and unfair. And that by doing the research, fairness would be introduced into the system. Because there would be some kind of clear cut little set of boxes and things like this that the people could go by and that you wouldn't have this phenomenon of a really good advocate getting better housing for their clients than the mediocre advocate was getting for their clients. So it kind of, I would say, caused all of the knowledge that was sitting there within the system and the bodies of the workers, it kind of discounted all that in favor of waiting until the research results came out. so good and so bad at the same time. <laughs> you know, I know, I like that. My, my they are, we're so good. <laughs> Yesterday. Everyone's in a union. No, today, I, I think, in a way, I think I, you know, I didn't understand it, I think, with today's details. Yeah. I kind of understand yesterday. Better, maybe? Um, and, so my question now is a little bit like, um, how, could it be, how could it be so bad? How could it be that research that is actually that, as you were saying, only two small groups of people want? So the researchers and the politicians. But everybody else knows that the problem is elsewhere. Yeah. And that the money given funding, funding research could better be used in other ways. How could it get to this point that not only are people harmed and human rights negated that, or given and taken away, but also that the kind of research that you say you have, you and uh, maybe the generation, um, has built through community-based work um, that is that comes out with research questions that come out of the community and that then go back to the community in terms of valuing their knowledge production, right? Um, and changing maybe research agendas according to these. Then how did it come to be that it could, that there is still this understanding and yet this research seems, seems to have taken over? I think there's a, there's, a, there's a series of factors, some of which are all the responsibility of my generation. So I think that um, as postmodern as we were, I'm skeptical about the, the progress discourse. I think we did have some sense that research was getting better and more responsive and more responsible. And we felt that the community-based research movement was like pretty much wholly good 
and would lead to kind of the opening out of research. But it became kind of bureaucratized, literally in the grant process, <coughs> so that it became specified that a community partnership looks like this. But also because the people that were doing that research were often like organic intellectuals, to use a Gramsci term, who then got this kind of um, desire to go into this academic space, which seems to be the space of intellectual life and intellectual activity. And no one wanted to say, ooh, there might be a problem for you to do that. I think, in fact, we were encouraging people to go into the university system, which seemed to be expanding. We now know that that was a you know, time-based thing, and that it would soon kind of retrench. And so I think there was a kind of period of time when th some things were getting better and there was the training of a different generation of people who maybe had a different set of values, but then the system itself kind of like deadened any moral sensibility in that group of students. So I see a really big difference in the students I had 15 or 20 years ago who are coming out of activism and the students that are coming out of activism now. Um, so activism has changed. So the thing to which the you know, well-meaning university researcher is attaching him or herself is now a different kind of thing. Um, I think there's a lot of professionalization. I don't exactly understand where that comes from, but I've noticed recently in some of the things I do on the side that there are a lot of younger people coming in to do like community facilitation, who've gone through these credentialing programs. And I'm kind of like, you know, and they have little labels for the names of those particular styles of doing um, like mediation stuff. And so I'm, I'm sort of like, I don't really understand like why, where the desire to have these kinds of